All right, well, hey, welcome friends in the room. Everybody tuning in online, get excited. We are uh, continuing this series. There he said, looking at some shocking statements that Jesus said. Let me read the passage we're going to be in tonight where Jesus said some pretty astounding things about prayer and asking and talking to God. This comes from Matthew chapter 7. Starting in verse 7, Jesus is in the middle of Sermon on the Mount, one of the greatest, if not the greatest sermon of all time. And he's talking about prayer. And he says this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if your son asked for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Ask and you shall receive. Ask and it will be given to you. What? Is Jesus saying? It kind of reminds me of uh, a season in life. Anybody engaged in the room in here? Yeah, sore subject, okay? <laughs> Nobody elbow. And please do not let that cause conflict later tonight. Just blame it on me. Say, he said it cannot cause conflict. For those of you that are engaged, you're in a season where you get to experience what I think is one of the best parts, if not the best part of being engaged, which is called the wedding registry. What is the wedding registry? Well, this is whenever you and that special someone, that fiance, you get together and because you did the incredible thing of deciding to get married together, you now put a list of every gift that you would like someone else to buy you together and then send it out to your friends. It's it's pretty astounding because it's the only time in life where you can send a list of specified gifts hey, look, you don't have to give me anything, but if you do, I'd like it to be one of these. And (laughs) not come across as entitled and like a brat that you're giving specific, here are the things we would like for you. We want a gift from you. And we've already picked out the gift we want to get from you. It's amazing. I mean, it's incredible. And if that wasn't good enough, at some point along the way, they added an element, I think, to make it better for the grooms who had to go through Bed Bath & Beyond and Crate & Barrel and wherever else one goes, and it's this, it's a laser gun. So you go in and they hand you a laser gun. You don't sit down and write a list and check it twice. They give you a laser gun and you go around the store playing duck hunt, shooting whatever you and your fiance would like to be a part of, you know, the gifts that people give you. It sounds similar. And the reason I bring that up is it's this idea of like, hey, ask, put together the list of everything that you would like to receive. Bring your asks together. Let me give you a couple in case you are engaged. This is just for free, just while we're on the subject. Haven't done this in a while. Here's the things that if you are engaged to take off of your list, okay? Number one, find China. You do not need, the Queen of England is not coming to your house anytime soon. Nobody needs teacups and all that fine China. Another one that you do not need, and I'm going to give you the best ones that you need, is a juicer. Okay, for whatever reason, fiancés, they come in and they're like, we need a juicer. If you're not currently juicing, You will not, in marriage, need a juicer. It's going to sit in that shelf and take up the very limited real estate that you have in that one-bedroom apartment, okay? (laughs) Another one, you don't need a popcorn maker. They got microwaves, bro. You don't need an ice cream maker. These are things you're going to be tempted to register for, and you will never, ever use them. They will look back, and they will just be relics. A A waffle maker. You don't need a waffle maker. You're going to make waffle. Ah, okay. You're going to do it. You're going to do it one time. You're going to put the chocolate chips in there. It's going to get mess everywhere. It's not going to look like any restaurant that you've been to. And you will put it up and you'll never use it again. There are a few things, just again, just for free. And don't get the message. If you're engaged, the list of things you should ask for should include some good towels. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know why I'm talking about this, but you're going to have those towels for years and years. People pick out some high quality. Number two, high thread count bed sheets. You spend a third of your life 
and you're going to be in that bed with her or with him, you want to make sure that you're sleeping on something comfortable. And number three, this is most important, especially men, if you're engaged, you've got to hear me on this. A robotic vacuum, okay? <laughs> we are living in the Jetson age now. And you get that robot vacuum, and here's what I've noticed about women. They all have something in common. They love clean floors. I've never met one that doesn't love clean floors. You get the robot vacuum. It's not that expensive. You get it, you put it on your house, you set it, it cleans everything. You're going to be husband of the year, and I would like a little bit of credit, okay? So add it to your list, robot vacuum. But whatever's on your list, it's your list. You can add anything you want. Because you're engaged, you're going through it, you got your wedding registry. And I say all that because in a similar way, it seems like Jesus says that as Christians, we're to put together, as it were, a wedding registry, a list of bringing all of your, not wedding asks, but all of your asks to God. And he seems to say, and when you do so, you're going to receive. Or is he saying that? Maybe better say, yeah, well, what are you saying, Jesus, that we're to put together a, a list of things that we want and we're to bring them to you? And how do we make sure that we do receive what we're asking for? So I want to walk through this passage as we're in the series. There he said it. And look at the shocking statement of Jesus. Ask and you will receive. Because I think there's two ways we misunderstand this verse. One is we think of God as, man, it seems like Jesus is saying, he's like genie from Aladdin. Rub the lamp, give the wish, going to get it. And that's not entirely what he's saying. Or it's not what he's saying. But the other way we often think of in prayer is we kind of write it off and we're like, man, of course he's not saying ask for things and you're going to receive him. Prayer really doesn't even work. And, you know, every time that I try it, it just, it feels like God's going to do what he's going to do anyways. And, you know, I pray for 15 seconds and then my mind is just flooded with all kinds of distractions. I don't know where you're at in the room, but as it relates to prayer, I want to talk and break down what exactly Jesus is saying. We're going to look at two ideas behind this idea. There he said it, ask and you shall receive. Two ideas from Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to read and break down the verses again and we'll walk through it. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Now look at verse 8. So he just said, ask, or yeah, ask and it will be given, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be open. Now, for everyone who asks, receive, and the one who seeks, finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. He just said the exact same thing twice. And not only that, he essentially says the same thing three times twice. In other words, even the Greek word for ask and seek and knock are, are really not that different. He's saying, go to God, go to God, go to God. The first idea that Jesus is pointing out and hitting home is that you and I have been invited into a relationship where you continually are bringing, hey, God, these are the things that I'm fearing. These are the things that I'm facing. These are the things that I feel right now. These are the wants that I have. And that you and I, if you're a follower of Jesus, have been invited into a relationship where whatever I'm facing, I'm to talk to God about it. I'm to talk to, about it. Talk to God about it. The first idea is that you and I as Christians, as it relates to ask and you receive, the first thing he's hammering home is you are to be praying continually. You know what's interesting? All throughout the New Testament, Jesus has a running theme of teaching this idea. Where on multiple occasions, he tells stories and parables in Luke 12 and Luke 18, right here, where he's saying, go to God, go to God, go to God. And in Luke 18, it says this, then Jesus told them a parable to show them they should always pray. You should always be talking to God and never give up. And Jesus is saying, keep going, keep communicating. Whatever you're feeling, what you're facing, continue bringing it to God. If that wasn't enough, even think of the English translation of ask, seek, knock. What does that spell? Ask as though he could not be any more clear. 
bring those requests to God, which is really important because oftentimes in life, I mean, for most Christians, in conversations I'll have with things that they're afraid of, a job interview they have coming up, you know, they're worried about a sickness in their, themselves or their family or something in their life. And I'll ask, hey, have you prayed about that? And they're like, no, I haven't prayed about it. And when you think about it, it makes sense what Jesus would say. Hey, God wants a relationship where you're continually communicating, where you're constantly in conversation with him. That he is saying, ask, go to God, get your ask in gear and go to him and communicate. <laughs> All right, save me the email. I mean that as though you ask and ask and ask. <laughs> He's further saying God's door is always open. That unlike today where, you know, when somebody knocks at the door, there's like a suspicion and it's kind of bizarre. For whatever reason, in the last 20 years, this all changed. Like when I was growing up as a kid, people would come knock at the door and you'd run to the door. You're so excited. It could be, you know, Girl Scout cookies that are going to be delivered or a neighborhood kid wanting to play kickball. Today, when somebody knocks at your door, <laughs> oh man, everybody freaks out. It's like, what? why does DoorDash not just leave the food there? I don't need to, I don't need a handoff. Just leave, the, even from the other side, you're looking through that little people at your apartment and you're like, I think he'll just leave it and go away if we wait long enough because we all like kind of, you know, have a closed door policy and, and Jesus says, God's door is always open. He's always there. He's invited you in. And let me give you the context. It's a really important context. When Jesus gives this sermon, he's trying to paint a picture to an audience that had some understanding of God, but saw him as some distant force. Someone that priests in the temple, which was very nearby when Jesus spoke this, where priests could go and they could talk to God and they could have a relationship and they would be near to God. But for the average person, they had to work through a priest. And Jesus says, no, you've been invited into a relationship where you see God as father and where you understand he sees you as a child. His audience is having every category blown for, I can talk to God? And not just that, like God hears me? Over and over throughout even Matthew chapter 6, when he teaches his, his, uh, the audience there, which is right before this, how to pray. And he says, here's how you should talk to God. Father in heaven, or heavenly dad, holy is your name, or amazing, you are incredible. Would you give me today's needs? When we even think about that, for whatever reason, our brain translates it into old English and we don't hear what his audience heard. Where we hear, you know, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And King James Version, his audience heard something very different. Jesus saying, no, 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 you, God's like a father. And he wants a relationship like a father with you. I know there's parts of my heart and my life, and I think all of ours were, that's so difficult for me to comprehend because think about the type of relationship a child has with their father compared to, you know, a, a neighbor's kid has with somebody. In other words, remember when you were a kid growing up, you go to a friend's house and you're thirsty and you're like, hey, um, Mrs. Johnson, would you mind if I had a cup of water? When it was your house, it didn't look like that at all. It was, hey, yo, mom, we ain't got Capri Sun because somebody go to Kroger and get some Capri Sun because we're playing video games. It was astounding. <laughs> and Jesus is saying, and the Bible hammers home, not in an irreverent way, but in a, man, you're, you're my father in heaven. And that's the type of relationship he's invited you and I into. And some of you, when even you pray, and God's he's saying, ask continually ask, bring those asks to me. It's hard for you to even compute that because you, you talk to God different than you talk to people. And maybe it was because the way you were raised or you just modeled and you heard priests pray. But when, when you do pray, you downshift into King James version like you're reading the, the you know, Declaration of Independence or something. <laughs> and not just, God, man, this one, I'm, I'm, I'm really anxious right now. I don't know if I'm going to get the job and I feel like I'm just overwhelmed. And honestly, I'm, I'm still thinking about the last conversation that I had with that coworker and what they think about me. Like you don't even feel like you can have that type of honest dialogue. 
And maybe the best takeaway for some of us in the room would just be pray honest prayers. It's not like he doesn't know already. It's not like he didn't understand and see what you're feeling. I was talking to a friend not long ago and And I'm telling you, I think this just is so pervasive in how we think, where we try to reverse psychology on God. What do I mean? I was talking to a friend. It was a girl who was serving here for years, an amazing godly girl, and she was single. And she was like, I'm I'm just struggling with singleness. And I I asked, have you prayed about that? Or what does that look like? And she said, no, I feel like honestly, I I can't talk to God about that because I'm like, if I say I'm struggling with singleness, then he's going to make me continue to be single until I'm okay with not being single. Think about that reverse psychology of, no, I can't tell God that because if I tell God that, then he's going to continue to make me single until I am happy being single. (laughs) You're crazy. (laughs) It could be inside of all of our heads where we're like, man, I can't, uh, you know, where part of us just thinks, oh, no, he doesn't really know. He knows all of it. And Jesus says, he's invited you into a relationship where you call him father. What do I pray for as it relates to go to ask and ask? It's very important. Anything you care about, you should talk to God about it. First Peter chapter five, verse seven says, cast all of your cares on God because he cares for you. What do you think he means by cast? Throw it out in the water? No, clearly he's saying, bring all of those things to God. It's really beautiful, powerful verse. He says, cast everything you care about to God. Bring all of what you care about to God because you are what God cares about. Pretty profound. That anything that you're anxious about, anything you're feeling, any of those desires, man, I'm going to bring all of those to God. God, I want to I have a spouse doesn't mean you're guaranteed you're going to get a spouse, but it doesn't make you any more spiritual for pretending that you don't want that. It makes you inauthentic. And he's invited you in a relationship where you see him as father and you bring those requests to me. Is he saying, this is important, that everything you ask for, you will get? No. Thank God you are not saying that. Or else so many of us will be married to Stephanie from second grade right now Or we'd be, you know, like an astronaut or some other job that you were like, this is all that I want to be in life. No, he's not saying that. You will get an answer. The answer will either be yes, no, or not now. The answer will be yes, no, or not now. When does God, when is it an automatic yes? The Bible seems to say there's occasions where it is an automatic yes. And those occasions are where God's will for your life and God's desires align with our requests. Jesus says over and over again this idea that anything you ask in my name or according to my will, ask it and I will do it. John chapter 14 verse 13 says, you may ask of me anything in my name and I will do it. John chapter 15, verse 7 says, If you remain in me and I in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. Six times in John chapter 16 and 17, he says, Ask anything you want in my name, and I'll give it to you. Now, does that mean we just say, you know, Hey, Lord, I would like a Lamborghini in your name. And boom! (laughs) No, that would be amazing. But no, it means whenever God's will Revealed will and sovereign will, when it just intersects, those are the times we understand that it happens. But nevertheless, he's invited us to a relationship where you bring those things constantly to him. If you're in a dating relationship right now, you know the things that weigh you the most down, like like, like your mom is sick, or you're out of a job, or you're worried about something. Do you talk to the person you're dating about that like one time? No. You're not like, oh man. Um, my mom is sick. Okay, good. We talked about it. We can move on. You bring it. It's, it's constantly there. And he's invited us into a relationship where you can ask and trust him. Then he goes into and answers, I think, a really important question that a lot of us are wondering whether we would put it in this way as it relates to... When I ask, 
and I don't get what I asked for, and I do get something I didn't ask for, is that because God is a bad gift giver? Like, remember that registry, when my wife and I registered for ours, um, we registered and we filled it out, and inevitably, this is gonna happen if you're engaged, just get ready for it. I'm telling you your future right now. Somebody will do what's called, I went off the registry. And they will buy a gift that you didn't ask for, but they thought, you know what, I'm going to give them this, which is always a gamble. And oftentimes, it's just because the person is just not very good at giving gifts. For example, with us, somebody gave us this gift, and it was a nativity set, which is awesome. But it had Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Each of them were a foot and a half tall. It was like a statue's. I was like, oh man, this is great. And, and the worst part was like, they, they were a well-off family. I'm like, dude, I know this is like a $500 set that we can't sell on eBay or do anything that's sitting on our attic right now. And we didn't ask for it. They just went off the registry and I'm thankful. I thought it was great. It's my wife. She doesn't like it if you listen to this. And <laughs> it was just a reflection of, oh man, why did you not just stick with the registry? is the times when we get something we didn't ask for because God is, is he just not great at giving gifts? And Jesus answers that in a really important way. It's cruder, it's kind of comical as I'm being about it. And here's what he says. Which of you, if your son asked for bread, would give him a stone? I mean, Jesus is talking. I'm going to talk to all the dads in the room. If you had a son come up and say, Dad, can I have some bread? Would you give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would you give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, and by evil, he just means in comparison to God. Every, the best and worst earthly father in comparison to God is evil compared to a perfect, loving, holy God. He says... Even the worst dad is not going to do that. How much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? He brings up bread and fish. Bread and fish was an incredibly common meal in that day. You read the New Testament, you'll see multiple occasions where fish and loaves or they ate fish and they had bread with it. It was just uh, very common, not fancy. It's not hors d'oeuvres, not filet mignon. The son comes up and says, dad, hey, can I, can I have some bread? Can I have some fish? In other words, I just, I just need something to eat. I just need to eat in order to live. And Jesus is saying, just like in that scenario where a child is saying, I, I just, this is the bare need that I have. I'm bringing it to you, Dad. There's no dad out there. Even the worst dad wouldn't be like, oh, you, you want some bread? Here's a rock. Oh, you have a fish. Oh, here's a snake. Ah. <laughs> Nobody would do that. It's, it's crazy. It's comical. It's Jesus jokes. And he's going, even the worst dad out there would not do that. And you by comparison, are evil. Do you think God would do that? He says, no, God only gives good things. He doesn't give all things. He only gives good things. The second idea I want to talk about, this idea of ask and receive, involves continually praying continually. That's the first idea. And the second one is equally as important, and that is trust constantly as it relates to living the Christian life, there is a faith that is involved to walk through and hold on to the fact of the teachings of Jesus, which is he only gives good things, which means if I experience a not good thing, it's either not from God and it's a part of living in a broken world, or it is something that though I cannot see it right now, will be good because God's not done. It is either not from God or it is something that one day I will see how despite the ways and times and feelings, that, why would this happen? I'll see it and see that it was good. 
Because God, he only gives good things. And if he goes off the registry of my asks, and he gives me something I didn't ask for, or he doesn't give me something I asked for, it's not because he doesn't love me. He proved that by dying on the cross, by coming and dying for everything you've ever done. So it's not because he doesn't care about you if he doesn't give you what you want. And it's not because he can't. He's all powerful, created everything. He can do anything. The reason why is because he knows something that I don't. So if I ask for something and I don't get it, it's not because he doesn't care and not because he can't. It's because he knows something that I don't. It's like this. My daughter is three, and she is probably the least healthy eater I've ever met in my life. I'm like, who is raising this child? And I'm totally kidding. But what's not kidding is, I mean, she would eat Cheetos and Pringles for every meal. Uh, she doesn't want, <laughs> amen, thank you. She, yeah, you are a people. It's like, hey, we're going to eat some vegetables. We're going to try a piece of fruit, okay? Just anything other than Cheetos and Pringles. And she doesn't understand. She will throw fits and be like, I want Pringles, because she can't say her R's. So she's like, Pringles. And it's like, no, we're not eating Pringles. You need to eat some fruit. I want Pringles. Give me the Pringles. And it's like, you're about to get a spanking. And she will starve herself until you give me the Pringles. <laughs> It's like, what is, she can't comprehend that you can't eat Pringles and Cheetos for every meal. And the fact that you're angry at your parents because we won't allow you to do that because we understand something you don't, which is that is not a healthy, nutritious diet. You will be malnourished. And at three, you can't comprehend that. But there's something you don't understand. And I'm not giving you Pringles, not because I don't love you and not because I don't have them because I know something you don't know. I understand something you don't. And could it be possible that in a very similar way, of a three-year-old to a 30-something-year-old, there's a breakdown in understanding that infinite, holy, perfect, all-knowing, all-wise God could look at us when there's something we're saying, I want the Pringles of blank. And he says, it's not because I don't care about you. It's not that I couldn't give it to you. It's I know something you don't. And you can trust me. I've shown I'm a God who will care for you and provide for you to the farthest length, even dying on a cross. I know in this room, there are some times where life, and because it's a broken sin world, it's, it, it feels like it just handed you a snake a stone. And there are times where represented here, I know in this room right now and listening at 14 different locations, you're walking through something and it feels like a snake and a stone. And some of it is because it's not from God. He didn't want it. He didn't create it. He didn't cause it. He may have allowed it. And the challenge emotionally is when you're walking through a chronic illness, when you're walking through a breakup, when you're walking through the loss of a parent, it doesn't matter if he caused it or if he allowed it. I'm still walking through pain. And it's hard to understand how that's not a stone or a snake. And the Bible tells us that God has promised everything good comes from one place, that's him. And for Christians, everything not good will be made good in eternity. That one day we will see it from a different lens and understand how right and all the brokenness and all the pain and all the suffering that he was working and bringing about good through it in ways that I'll never be able to understand. And candidly, I wouldn't even try or I would fail miserably to try to articulate in your particular situation with all the pain that you've walked through. How is God going to bring good about through that? This, this week is, like I mentioned earlier, it's JD's birthday, which is awesome, so fun. It's also the anniversary of his dad dying in his early 40s, 40s of pancreatic cancer. Do you know how rare that is? How do you tell me that's anything but a stone or a snake? And while I don't know all the ways God will bring about good through that, through your pain, I know that he has promised one day every tear will be wiped and I will make everything beautiful in its time. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 says, He has made as in it's done. It will be done. Everything beautiful in its time. That God will redeem everything that he allows. Every chronic illness that as many of friends in this room have, that you plead with God to take away. I can't even understand how he would use that or use abuse, how he's going to take horrific things and weave them together for good. But he's promised that he will. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it also says a, a very common verse that we know that in everything, all things, God works together for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. I don't know what you're walking through, but I know in this life or in the one to come, you will see and I will see even the worst of things woven together for good. Maybe you're walking through a breakup. I remember one of the most terrible times in my life was a breakup that I had with my wife. We broke up and spent two years apart. And I was in that stage, and you know it, like breakups, I mean, they're not the end of the world, but they're the end of something that was a huge part of your world. And it feels like, oh, man, just rip the heart out of my chest and put on Brian McKnight songs and Taylor Swift and just sit in sackcloth and ashes and wondering, why, God? Why did this happen? And we spent two years apart and, and then ended up, we dated again and we got married shortly after that. In that two years, which I never would have asked for, and pales in comparison to so much of the pain represented here, but God got a hold of my heart and deepened my faith and my knowledge of his word in a way that today I still pull from. I don't know who I would have been without those two years. And I look back and it was so painful, and yet I'm so thankful. And I, I don't pretend to try to transfer that onto horrific pain that is represented here. Just saying like that, and a dozens or hundreds of other Ways in my own life and lives of other people I've seen, I've seen God bring about good through tragedy, through pain, through heartache. Sometimes we can see it and someday we will see it. And we see it from above. It, it's like this. I, I was invited to a, a football game. Somebody had tickets and I got to go down and, and sit on the ground floor or sit on the floor and... Um, and I was walking around and was seeing the game and then halftime, the, it was college football and marching bands come out on the field and begin to do the marching thing. And if you've ever sat in on the front row or you've ever sat in on the field level, seeing the game and seeing the marching band is a totally different perspective because you can't quite see all that you can see if you sit in another location. And so I'm watching the marching band and I just see these guys come out and you got the tubas and the trombones and the clarinets, I think, and the, the trumpets and all these different instruments and they're walking and they're going and it looks like they're walking right at each other and you're like, oh man, the tuba is about to take out that trombone and they take a turn and they make the sharpest turns and they're going to all these angles and you got drummers going everywhere. It just looks chaotic and it's like what is going on it's like somebody kicked an ant pile of band kids on the field <laughs> and you look like uh, it just looks chaotic because you're seeing it like eye level and then you look up at the jumbotron and when you see it from above you see this purpose and beauty and order and it's spelling out something and everything that looks so chaotic when you looked at it on the ground level, so messed up, when you see it from above, it was purpose, intentionality behind all of it. And I wish that I could connect the dots in your life of how that's gonna happen, but I can't. But I do know it's gonna happen if you are a follower of Jesus. And in the meantime, he's invited us. You can come and you can ask and you can know, bring all of those requests. And if he doesn't answer the prayer the way you want it, it's not because he doesn't care. It's not because he can't. It's because he knows something that you don't. I don't. Tim Keller, who's a well-known pastor, put it this way. He said, God will give us when we ask him, we ask to receive. He will either give us what we ask or what we would have asked if we knew everything he does. God will either give us, God, will you take this away? Will you 
bring a spouse in my life? Will you take the sickness away? Will you help me to finish school? Will you provide a job for me? He'll either give us those things that we asked for or what we would have asked for if we knew and could see everything that he sees. And in the meantime, he's invited us. You can ask knowing your father in heaven, he only gives good things. So if it's not good, it's either not done or it's not from him. And he will bring about good eventually through it. I said earlier, just to wrap up, that uh, the best thing about being engaged was all the different presents that you get and the gifts that you receive, you know, when you get married. And really, that's not true. The best thing about being married is not the fact that you're going to sit there and you, eventually you, you get married, you receive all those gifts, and you're sitting open in the toaster, and for this person, the waffle maker, and for you, whatever other things you added to your list. That's not the best part of being married at all. It's not the gifts you receive, it's the relationship you step into. And you know what's funny is, as awesome as all those things you asked for are, and everything you get, you enter into this relationship where all of them shrink and pale in comparison to the greatest gift, which is her, or a wife, or him, a husband. And all the other stuff, it's nice and it's, it's cool, but it, it's a joke to even put them on the same level of playing field of uh, husband and gifts, receiving things you ask for. I think there's going to come a day where all of us will see that the greatest gift, need, thing that we at our heart of hearts have ever wanted was none of the things that you have asked for, wished that God would do. It was always been him. It's always will be him. I believe that because, you know, the same passage occurs in two different places in the New Testament. It occurs in Matthew chapter 7 and it occurs in Luke chapter 11. Exact same verses, exact same words with two exceptions. Luke reads through and he says, ask and you'll receive, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, seeks, and everyone, or everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who seeks, finds, and everyone who knocks, the door is open to you. And then he says the same thing. If you are evil and you know how to give good gifts, how much more will your heavenly father? And he changes two words. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. If you, though you were evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Luke, the same exact story. Another occasion Jesus is teaching. And he says, man, your Father in heaven, like any good father, he loves to give good things to their kids. I love giving good things to my kids. When we go to the store, I want to give them good gifts. I love doing that. And Luke says... You have a father in heaven. He loves giving good things. But you know what more than anything he loves? Giving the best thing, which is him. So much so that he would give his own life on the cross so that you would have the greatest need, desire, and ask that you will ever have, which is him. And candidly, the longer that I've just been doing this and the older that I get, the more that I see in life people going, as they deepen in their relationship with God, they discover all of the things that they think, man, if I just had that, I'd be happy. If I just had that, man, life would be amazing. They begin to discover, you know, <laughs> I'm thankful that God has given me what he has. I'm thankful that, you know, he's given me a house or family and car. But more than anything, I am thankful that I have him. More than anything that I want. And God, I'm thankful for all the stuff that you've given me. More than any of that, though, I want you. Like I mentioned with my kids, I love giving them good things. I hope they have good things. I hope they have good lives. I hope they're healthy. I hope they get married. I hope we get to be a grandfather of their grandkids or of their kids. I hope that all of life goes well. But more than any of that, I hope that they know Jesus. And they receive the greatest gift, the greatest need, and the greatest thing that they desire, whether or not they realize it, which is him. And that is a gift that if you ask for tonight, God has an amazing track record. Would you begin to go, God, you know what? I, I do need a car and I do need a job, but more than any of that, I want you. I want more of you. I want you in a deeper relationship with you. You will discover that is a prayer God loves 
to answer. And if you're in the room tonight and you have never invited or asked God, hey, I'm asking you, Lord, for a relationship with you. I'm inviting and I'm asking, you know, I'm beginning to think I was made for something more than just the American dream. I was made for a relationship with you, God. And so I'm asking you, will you allow me to put my faith in Christ, receive the Holy Spirit? I want you, I want you. You will discover tonight the one you were made for, the one who died on a cross for every sin that you've ever done and ever will do, who came back alive, who you came into this world with every breath, desiring whether you realize it or not, and you will die and breathe your last breath, having been made for him. And the reason you're here tonight is to receive that, because if you ask, you will receive the one you were made for, or has a name, Jesus, and God, who is willing and dying quite literally for you to know him. Let me pray. Father, I pray that you would allow any person who's never put their faith in Jesus to receive the greatest desire and ask and need that they have, which is not more stuff, it's not a different relationship status, it's you. And you would allow them to simply say, God, I believe that. I know I'm not on my own, it's not working. I need your help and I invite you, I'm a sinner. And I ask you for your help. And I receive through Christ forgiveness. Take my life. God, would you, would you bless every person in here? Would you allow them to have favorite work incredible marriages, incredible futures. But more than anything, would you give them more of you? That they would ask that for the rest of their days and receive. In Christ's name, amen.